Hello, everyone. Once again, uh, my name is Maros, Maros Matiaško. I'm coming from uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, um, we don't have much time and the topic uh, I would like to discuss today is quite broad. So I will just keep the, the introduction uh, on my side and uh, I will just jump, jump right into it. So uh, what, I will, what I would love to discuss today is the question of overcoming barriers in access to justice uh, for vulnerable groups and especially for people with uh, disabilities because the pandemic situation, it seems that it uh, has been affecting uh, significantly, uh, especially people with disabilities and people of age and people of age with disabilities and especially those who, who are being institutionalized or who are in social care homes or in uh, other type of for health or social social care institutions and uh, the, uh, one of the biggest questions for lawyers and uh, and also judges but also people in practice human rights lawyers and your lawyers is the question of access uh, to justice in situation when they face uh, human rights violations including uh, um, really serious violations like uh, violation of the right to life for example or uh, prohibition of ill treatment or at least they would like to make such a claim uh, so Today, I would like to discuss what does it mean uh, an access to justice for people with disabilities. And I will be talking about Article 13 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, I will refer to these conventions as uh, CRPD. Uh, then uh, I will try to identify uh, three levels of barriers. Uh, we may say systemic barriers. Uh, which we can identify and then I would like to suggest a way how to overcome these barriers. Um, so uh, let's do that. Uh, my first slide, uh, here is a reference to Article 13 of the CRPD. Uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2006 and it has quickly become an extremely important international human rights treaty with diverse applicability. One of the core provisions is also Article 13 of the CRPD that provides for the right to access to justice. Uh, as you can see, it's formulated as uh, interdependent yet self-standing right, imposing obligations traversing across the whole convention and relating to all human rights, including uh, uh, the right to life, of course, prohibition of ill treatment, the right to health, for example, uh, or the right to private and family life. Uh, the importance of this provision is also emphasized by the fact that, uh, for example, the Strasbourg Court has been referring to Article 13 uh, CRPD uh, in a number of judgments. The most recent one is, for example, N versus Romania from 2017. So it's a relevant provision and it's a provision that uh, has been implied or, uh, in practice uh, also uh, on the level of uh, the European Court of Human Rights. What does it say uh, specifically? If we want to identify certain uh, core elements, we may say, uh, I, I highlight it uh, Part of the part of the this provision uh, to identify these maybe the most important core elements uh, of the right to access to justice for people with disabilities. And the first element is the that the access to uh, justice must be effective. So there is an element of efficiency. Uh, the second element. Uh, means that it must be ensured on equal basis so there is an element of equality and third uh, this element of equality inter alia uh, refers to a really specific provision and concept uh, in the crpd that is called reasonable accommodation and that we may say uh, or call it uh, as the element of flexibility so we have three elements uh, the element of efficiency the element of equality and the element of flexibility. And I will now uh, discuss all these three elements in more detail. Uh, in relation to the element of efficiency, uh, the UNCRPD committee uh, based in Geneva uh, adopted a general comment on uh, number six on, 
on prohibition of discrimination against people with disabilities. And uh, in this uh, general comment, uh, they also uh, shortly discussed uh, the question of access to justice under Article 13. And uh, according to the authoritative interpretation of Article 13, uh, in order to ensure effective access to justice, all processes must allow participation and must be transparent. So here we here we have two additional elements within the element of effective access to justice, and that is the participation and transparency. Uh, in relation to these two uh, more concrete uh, elements or principles, we may say, it means that delivery of information must be in an understandable and accessible manner. Uh, information typically about how to access justice, what does it mean for you, uh, then the outcome of the justice or the decision, uh, how you can appeal, uh, etc. Uh, then recognition and accommodation of diverse forms of communication. Uh, this is very important also for people with disabilities. And here it's not only the technical way, uh, which is which was kind of emphasized within the pandemic situation, but it also different forms of communication uh, by Diff, uh, by uh, by using uh, different methods, including uh, including, for example, uh, 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 online uh, or face to face, or via phone or via via Zoom, for example, and other forms of communications, uh, which is quite challenging if uh, if we imagine someone with uh, severe disabilities, uh, and even the face to face the, uh, communication is. Uh, it's difficult. So when we are using online communication, it's even more. It's even more difficult and uh, even more challenging for for uh, for people uh, working in the in um, um, in the domain of justice. Uh, then it's a physical accessibility throughout throughout all stages of the process, and then it's a financial assistance in the case of legal aid. Uh, this has been formulated uh, for general situations, so it's not necessarily for pandemic situation, but it's relevant. It's relevant once the pandemic situation kind of emphasized or put an emphasis or on uh, certain aspects of the efficiency. And I underline two aspects, and that's a question of legal aid, which can be further described as general as well as uh, particular. and. Uh, these characteristics identified in relation to legal aid can serve for us in pandemic situation as sort of points of reference in relation to other procedural aspects. For our discussion, uh, what seems to be highly relevant is, uh, is the question of institutionalization, or uh, I can call it a situation of institutionalization of people with disabilities, including people of age. The element of institutionalization has been a concern also from other aspects than legal aid, that is the particular dimension of legal aid, uh, especially from, uh, from the viewpoint of the prevention of ill treatment. Uh, in other words, the situation of institutionalization justifies per se specific protection. Uh, and this element, if combined with another situation, is the situation of pandemic uh, justify even even more specific uh, approach? So here, uh, what can we be talking about? We can be talking about a certain scale, uh, also from legal perspective. Uh, so, but we uh, as lawyers, so we uh, we have an, we have no definition of uh, this kind of scale uh, yet. What we can imagine, we can still imagine it as a scale. And one may argue, and one can use uh, uh, the concept of uh, vulnerability as an analogy, uh, how to define a certain scale, and especially how to define corresponding positive obligations uh, coming out of what we may say, uh, this kind of scale. So I would like to propose understanding uh, these provisions or and our situation as a sort of uh, uh, a scale. Uh, um, so uh, this brings me to the element of uh, equality. Um, as we saw in Article 13, uh, the prohibition of discrimination is implicit. Uh, 
yet it follows uh, from other provisions in the CRPD uh, that expressly defines what does it mean uh, to discriminate against uh, persons with disabilities or on the grounds of disability. Uh, and especially there is a specific form of discrimination uh, against people with disabilities uh, that should be emphasized. And uh, that is the obligation to adopt a reasonable uh, accommodation, or we may call it a concept of reasonable accommodation. The concept of reasonable accommodation is defined under Article 2 CRPD. Uh, usually, we don't find it in uh, national legislation. Uh, so this definition from the CRPD is the most relevant uh, for us as lawyers also in the practice. So what does it mean, reasonable accommodation? It means necessary and appropriate modification and adjustments, not imposing a disproportionate or undue burden where needed in a particular case uh, to ensure to persons with disabilities the enjoyment of or exercise on an equal basis with others of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. Uh, in other words, it, it's an obligation to adopt specific measures and also in the domain of the access to justice. Uh, and uh, the, um, these uh, specific measures are actually not limited. Uh, so it's pretty much up to us uh, what we subsume under the definition of, uh, of specific procedural and age appropriate measures uh, as Article 13 uh, um, provides. Uh, there is, uh, and I suggested uh, uh, to consider uh, the question of access to justice uh, in pandemic situation uh, on a certain scale. Um, so, and I also suggested that we uh, we may think about the situation in terms of vulnerability. So, uh, I will go back to vulnerability. Why vulnerability? So, vulnerability is uh, it's a new concept in human rights law. It's it's emerging concept. Uh, it hasn't been defined, in my opinion, properly, not even by the Strasbourg court or applied, but still, uh, vulnerability is a concept, is a legal concept that uh, justifies uh, positive obligations. That's very important uh, also uh, from our perspective. And we, we, uh, we may use it and it can be more beneficial to rely on the concept of vulnerability example uh, than on other concepts like uh, open-ended concepts such as dignity for example or even equality uh, but they are they are interlinked so it's not like necessary we have to say uh, it's about dignity and not vulnerability no it's about both actually but vulnerability is something else uh, so uh, as I indicated in my previous slide, uh, one may think about uh, a certain scale concerning situations of uh, people concerning situations people have been experiencing, including in times of uh, of, uh, of COVID and uh, pandemic situation. And it is especially vulnerability that also seems to be a good navigation point uh, for lawyers. Uh, from the perspective of uh, of, uh, of theory and especially feminist or critical theory, uh, we may distinguish uh, so-called ontological vulnerability, and it simply means that everybody is vulnerable. Uh, it's me, it's you, uh, every, every being, every sentient being, not only human being, is vulnerable. Sometimes people call it a fragility, for example, or we we can uh, we can say ontological vulnerability that's a really important point because uh, uh, there is no such a thing as invulnerability uh, so it means that the starting point is that everybody is vulnerable uh, but some people because of certain situations and uh, experiences and the history maybe uh, are more vulnerable than others especially in particular situations and that's what we can call a situational uh, vulnerability. And uh, if we uh, if we go to the perspective of the Strasbourg Court, uh, we may distinguish uh, also this situational vulnerability uh, because the Strasbourg Court has been uh, uh, conceptualizing vulnerability in relation to specific groups uh, in specific situations, and uh, these specific groups are usually defined on biological grounds, such as age, 
it's typical uh, in immigration detention of, of minors. Uh, and uh, the legal concept that is associated uh, with, with this situation is actually the concept of uh, extreme vulnerability. So according to the court, they are facing or experiencing uh, young children in immigration detention are experiencing extreme vulnerability extreme are extremely vulnerable or their situation is extremely vulnerable uh, but also not only age but also disability uh, and uh, for example ethnicity uh, and situation of extreme vulnerability may justify specific response uh, typically in terms of positive obligations um, and my question would be uh, if we have a someone uh, in uh, in a situation of extreme vulnerability let's say a uh, uh, man of age uh, with uh, intellectual disabilities uh, closed uh, uh, in closed institution uh, being positive uh, of COVID, for example and uh, facing difficulties uh, reaching uh, reaching uh, the justice system and my question would be uh, who has the ability to respond who can respond and how can respond in other words uh, the, the question of response uh, concerns the question of responsibility actually the, the responsibility and when we when we track the etymology of the word of responsibility it's the response it's the answer to the situation so here we are we are facing a question of a responsibility of uh, of certain subjects of authorities to answer to a specific uh, situation of vulnerability or we can say extreme vulnerability and in uh, my opinion uh, can be especially judges or courts uh, who can uh, who can uh, appropriately uh, respond on the situation of extreme vulner vulnerability of those uh, persons with disabilities who are facing difficulties in access to in accessing justice. And this brings me to to another slide. Uh, and the question of uh, provision of procedural and age uh, appropriate accommodations. Um, I, I mentioned Article 2 CRPD and the definition of, uh, of reasonable accommodations. Uh, within this definition, there is a one specific aspect, and that is a possibility uh, to actually justify not taking accommodations. If there is an undue burden on authorities, then it may justify not to adopt specific measures. However, uh, under Article 13, the situation is different. Uh, there is an important interpretative principle um, introduced by the CRPD committee in their general comment number six. And it says that procedural accommodations in the context of access to justice should not be confused with reasonable accommodation even though there is a there is a uh, clear link to what we may call reasonable accommodation why the latter is limited by the concept of disproportionality that's the question of Andy Barden uh, procedural accommodations are not in other words uh, the justice system uh, cannot justify not adopting uh, accommodations uh, on the basis of uh, disproportionality so it's a it's a significant obligation and um, can be challenging to the to actually uh, to follow it uh, in absolute terms. But still, uh, that's 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 the high standard we have, and that's the standard we we should follow. And what what can it mean uh, in terms of the situation of people with disabilities uh, in times of, uh, of pandemic? Um, and this brings me to the question of barriers. Um, there, are some, there are obviously barriers in access to justice and there are, we may be thematizing barriers from different perspectives. And uh, I decided to put an emphasis on three maybe systemic issues uh, uh, or three levels, I, I three levels of barriers. Um, 
Fears, in my opinion, can be conceptualized uh, phenomen phenomenologically on three levels. Uh, and the first level I call I level. I need a voice. I'm a sound disability. I, was, uh, I need legal standing, basically, to, to approach judge, to, to approach other authorities. Uh, so that's I level. Uh, then, then we have a level, the second person level. The voice, my voice, my that's the question of participation. Uh, my level, my, my voice must be heard by me. And then we have uh, a uh, level uh, which we, which is uh, plural. We uh, we need an answer. Everybody needs an answer. And that's a quite appropriate remedy because the decision affects us all, the eventual decision. So three possible uh, mentions of different barriers. And I would like to discuss uh, all three levels of barriers uh, on the background of, uh, of jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, especially. So let me let me jump into the first uh, first level. So total of I uh, voice victim status. And let's question for me the the question of uh, victim status. Um, uh, so, oh, uh, victim status, uh, especially in one judgment, and that's Campeano, Valentin Campeano uh, versus Romania, uh, Center for Legal Resources on behalf of Valentin Campeano versus Romania, it's the long uh, name of the judgment. Uh, the court distinguish uh, direct indirect victims and also discuss the, uh, the procedural position of NGOs, especially NGOs. So, direct victims. Uh, it's an individual, uh, an individual must be alive, so the first condition, and an individual must be able to show that he or she was directly affected by the measure complained of. Uh, the question is, or the difficult question is when uh, an individual died. Uh, so then uh, we, uh, we may have an indirect victims or relatives and uh, there, the court differentiated between applications where the direct victim has died after the application was lodged with the court, and those who uh, who already died beforehand. And more restrictive approach uh, was adopted in cases that did not concern Article Two, so the right to the right to life. But my uh, my basic question is, and uh, my my discussion, uh, and I would like to focus on discussion of the legal standing of other bodies than uh, than uh, than relative uh, other bodies uh, and other subjects than uh, relatives, for example, because there are many people with disabilities uh, without any relatives, many people with severe disabilities uh, uh, without uh, without any actually uh, efficient legal standing and uh, but there are bodies like NGOs or ombudsperson's bodies uh, that may jump in and that may actually bring the case to the court and give uh, a person with disability a voice uh, so if I jump to a uh, question of NGOs so for us, uh, the most progressive judgment uh, is uh, Campania versus Romania. Um, what was the case about? Um, the application was lodged by an NGO on behalf of a young man, uh, a Roma man, uh, who died in 2004 at the age of 18. Uh, Valentin Campeano uh, had been placed in an orphanage at birth after being abandoned by his mother. When still a young child, he was diagnosed as being HIV positive and as suffering from severe mental disability. On reaching adulthood, he had to leave the Center for Disabled Children, where he had been staying and underwent a series of assessments with a view to being placed in a specialized institution. After a number of institutions had, had refused to accept him because of his condition, he was eventually admitted to a medical and social care center, which found him to be in an advanced state of psychiatric and physical degradation without any antiretroviral medication and suffering from malnutrition. A few days later, after the admission to this hospital, um, 
he was actually uh, found by uh, NGO monitors who reported finding him alone in an unheated room with a bed but no bedding and dressed only in a pyjama top. Although he could not e eat or use the toilet without assistance, the hospital staff re refused to help him for fear of contracting HIV. He was refusing food and medication and so was only receiving glucose through a drip. The NGO monitors concluded that the hospital had failed to provide him with the most basic treatment and care. Unfortunately, Valentin died, died the day after the NGO monitors discovered uh, his situation. And the main question was uh, who could lodge the application uh, with the domestic authorities and uh, eventually with the Strasbourg court. And uh, before the Strasbourg court, the, the main question was uh, the question of victims, the victim status, and also uh, the, admiss uh, the admissibility of an application filed by an NGO. And the court uh, accepted the, uh, the complaint, the application, and argued that uh, in this particular uh, situation, in this extreme situation, uh, it was uh, it was in uh, in the interest uh, uh, of Valentin Campeanu and uh, in the interest of pr protection of human rights to accept the application and rule on merits. The court uh, considered and to, took into consideration four aspects. First one that he was uh, Valentin. Uh, he was considered formally to be a person with full legal capacity. Uh, but obviously was not capable of initiating any such proceeding by himself without proper legal support and advice. Uh, the NGO's capacity to act for Mr. Campeanu, nor their representations on his behalf before the domestic medical and judicial authorities were questioned or challenged in any way. Uh, they actually filed a criminal complaint and they acted, uh, uh, they acted on domestic level. Uh, Further, Valentin uh, had no known next of kin, there were no relatives, and when he reached the age of majority, no competent person or guardian had been appointed as well. And also the court took into account uh, that uh, the complaint concerned uh, uh, the violation of the, of the right to life. So uh, taking this, uh, taking this uh, specific uh, consideration into account, the court accepted the application and ruled on the, on the merits. In other words, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say that uh, even uh, admissibility criteria, and here I'm referring to the, to the European Convention and admissibility criteria defined by the court are not, uh, uh, are not that restrictive. So still there is a place for flexible interpretation and that's very important. Uh, and that's the way how uh, the first barrier can be, can be actually overcome. And that's the, the flexib flexible interpretation of, uh, of criteria for accessing uh, the justice system. Uh, the second level, it's the question of hearing the voice, the question of participation. And here, uh, the idea is similar. Uh, that's the question of uh, flexibility uh, on the basis of, uh, of uh, reasonable accommodations. And the case is, uh, uh, is ZH versus Hungary, adopted already in 2012. Uh, in this case, uh, the case uh, concerned an applicant uh, who, who is deaf and mute, uh, illiterate and uh, was unable to use the official sign language. Uh, he also suffers from intellectual disability. Uh, he communicates using a peculiar sign language, like a method, and it's only intelligible to his mother, so he can uh, efficiently communicate only with his mother, uh, who understands him. In 2011, he was arrested on suspicion of mugging and interrogated at the police station. In the sole presence uh, of a sign language interpreter, he claimed he was unable to understand. 
He was detained afterwards on remand when a district court ordered his release and placement under house arrest after noting that his detention had to be kept to a minimum in view of his difficulties in communicating. Um, the applicant maintained that the conditions in which he was held were not fit for someone in his condition and that he had been molested by other inmates as well. What is important in this judgment is that uh, the court referred to, uh, to reasonable accommodation uh, principle uh, from the CRPD. And uh, as, as a principle, the court stated that uh, the court finds it reg regrettable that the authorities did not make any truly reasonable steps reasonable steps, which is a no notion quite akin to that of reasonable accommodation, to address the applicant's condition, in particular by procuring for him assistance by lawyer, in this particular case, or another suitable person. Uh, and in concrete, for the court, the police officers interrogating him must have realized that no meaningful communication was possible in the situation and that they should have sought assistance in the first place from the applicant's mother, who could have at least informed the officers about the magnitude of the applicant's communication problems, rather than simply making the applicant sign the minutes, the minutes of the interrogation. So again, we have a reference to reasonable accommodation and the basic principle is the principle of flexibility and uh, it brings me to my final final slide and which is the question of the answer and the answer the remedy uh, which is for everyone and um, here we can be thinking about uh, remedies uh, from maybe a different perspective and uh, we may be thinking about a, a complex set of remedies that can be uh, combined can be uh, transparently uh, discussed and also adopted. And um, usually, in my opinion, uh, courts are adopting uh, compensation as, uh, as, as a remedy. However, there is much more uh, that can be done. Uh, and uh, what we can rely on is uh, the UN, uh, UN uh, set of principles uh, adopted uh, uh, as a soft law and recommendation and uh, in this uh, this document uh, UN identified five forms of so-called reparations and these five five forms are restitution that's restitutio in integrum uh, then compensation for any economically accessible damage uh, then rehabilitation that's a very important one. Uh, it's medical and psychological care, as well as legal and social services. So it means that the court may be ruling on, uh, on an obligation to provide medical and psychological care, as well as legal and social services. Uh, then the question of satisfaction, uh, which means the cessation of continuing violations, full and public disclosure of the truth, and public apology, uh, but also commemoration and tri tributes to the victim, for example, uh, naming the hospital after the victim or after uh, a certain situation. Then, of course, trainings and guarantees of non-repetition, which are measures contributing to prevention. So uh, these, are, uh, these are five forms of reparations that can be used in combination and that can uh, address or answer uh, and remedy the situation in a in a complex complex manner and uh, that was my last slide so thank you very much for uh, for your attention and let's open the floor for the discussion thank you